I'd like you to turn with me, please, to Paul's letter to the Colossians, which is the focus of our study today. Our topic is the good, <coughs> the good news of Christ's uniqueness, and we want to look at the way in which <coughs> excuse me, Paul writes this letter to provide a shield to protect the hearts and minds of the people in Colossae against the false teachings, the threatening teachings that were coming uh, into the church at that time, which he'd learned about from um, the founder of their church who had joined Paul, in fact joined him in prison, and he writes to try to protect and to help them to face these tensions and pressures that are before them. I'd like us to listen to the heart of the letter in verses Uh, 15 to 24 of chapter 1 as we begin. Jesus Christ the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and don't move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. May the Lord make this part of his word come alive to us to equip and enable us in fresh ways for the service he calls us to. The occasion of the letter we need to think about a little bit. The letter is a positive, constructive response to teachings which were threatening the Colossian church. To grasp the message of the letter, we need a grip on the emphases of these threatening teachings. But Paul doesn't explicitly explain the teachings to which he's responding. As with most of his New Testament letters, we're hearing in the letter only one side of a discussion. Paul's response to what the church had sent to him. They know what he's talking about and what they'd asked and the problems and issues they've shared with him. We only know Paul's answer back. And you know how dangerous dangerous it is if you try to join in on your wife's phone conversation when you can't hear what's actually being said at the other end of the line. We have something of that kind of problem um, going on here. We are listening to a partial response, but we don't know what had actually come the other way. We have to attempt to reconstruct the ideas Paul was seeking to correct by reflecting on his answers. So, being very conscious of the difficulties in doing that, we suggest the following. First of all, that there were probably three sources um, from which pressure was coming upon the the Christians in in Colossae. One One or other of them may have been predominant, but it seems from the letter that all three are present in the background there. First, there's the pressure from the dominant foreign religion of Judaism. We assume, as in other places in Asia Minor, a proportion of the Colossian church had converted from a Jewish background, being either converted Jews themselves, or and that would mean migrant Jews living in Asia Minor, living in the Lycus Valley where Colossae is located, or local people who had previously turned to Judaism and become proselytes, or perhaps people who were resident in in Colossae, who had joined with the Jewish synagogue to learn of the Jewish ways, but perhaps had not yet become full proselytes. Certainly those categories of people were characteristic converts in the church's 
uh, that we know the details about, such as Thessalonica. Now they had turned to Christ, they were still under pressure, however, to heed the Jewish ways and the Jewish teachings. The synagogue claimed to be the true people of God, to be the guardians of the Abrahamic and the Mosaic traditions, to uphold the clear, definite law of God, and to follow the true moral code and superior monotheism of the one living God. So, what they said must be very important, because clearly Christianity comes out of that heritage. And possibly backed up by family connections and business opportunities, because we know the Jews were very influential in the business arena of their day, um, is a strong social as well as religious and philosophical pressure on them to turn back to Judaism or to add to their experience of Christ the requirements of the Jewish rituals and laws and so on. So here's the first challenge. The dominant religious group, through whom the gospel had actually come to them in a very important sense, are wanting them to return to the traditions and ways of that group. Now that situation is not at all unusual in mission settings all around the world, and we can learn therefore something from it. The second group though, is that there was clearly continuing syncretistic influences from traditional religious backgrounds, both from the Jewish background and also from the primal religious background that the people of the area, the Phrygians themselves, had grown up with. The, the usual question, why can't we just add the old onto the new? Why do we have to be so exclusive about our Christianity? Why can't we just be circumcised, keep the mosaic purity code and their food preferences, their ritual cleansings, avoiding of contaminated places and things and persons, and just add on those on top of the, the, the good news that we already have. What's wrong with um, joining together the old and the new? Surely it's okay for a Christian to keep on with the tra traditional customs, laws and religious performances. You know the very subtle ways in which these kind of questions come to us. Well, um, this pressure was clearly very strong from the way in which Paul responds uh, in the letter. But there seems to have also been a very strong third pressure, um, all per the all-pervasive religious and political ideology of the surrounding imperial culture. Rome and the Caesar of Rome was evident everywhere right across the Roman Empire. And this created a very strong pressure because to get on, to be successful in the Roman Empire, you had to acknowledge and, if possible, follow as many of the ways of Rome as possible if you wanted to be in the in-group. And this was very strong because, you see, emperor worship, while it wasn't extremely demanding, it had a huge way of life backing it up. The Roman way had integrated all aspects of life, the social, the economic, and the political. It had achieved freedom from strife and uncertainty through the Roman peace, the Pax Romana. Its benefits were evident on every hand, with ease of movement through safe roads and seas, for instance. New relationships with previous enemies could be explored through the now widespread use of international languages. You could now relate through trade and learning with a whole range of people that it was impossible to relate to before the coming of the great Roman power. These in turn, or these changes in turn, have brought new values and new confidence that international harmony could be achieved in a realizable future. And all this without the complication of so much of the detail of the local or the imported religions. Why not pay homage to the emperor with the, and offer the necessary dues to his cult and secure the promise of a safe, secular, fullness of knowledge and and experience and enjoyment for humanity. There was an attractiveness about the new ways of the colonial power, so why not embrace its cult as well? So many others in Colossae were doing it, why couldn't the Christians too? You know the kind of argument? And there are still very strong imperial powers that don't always claim the title, but they act that way, that have a similar pressure, a whole way of life coming from their empires and dominating especially the young people of our countries and nations. 
Who wants to be old-fashioned when all the authority and influence seem to be with the new empire and its ways of life, its breadth of liberty, its depth of learning, its excitement and freshment? Well, these alluring options were pressing in on the new believers. They may have been a, there may have been a strong heretical teacher offering one or the other of these alternatives to the new Christian way, or perhaps more likely it was just that these three subtle alternatives, less demanding and apparently more materially rewarding, Philosophies of life were right there in the everyday experience of the Colossians. Just as similar alternative lifestyles just deceptively beckon Christians in so many parts of our globalised Western-dominated economies and urbanised social and religious values of the 21st century. Paul didn't at any point spell out the, these threats and attack them head on, as I've said. But the positive advice he did give implied concerns such as those outlined were present in their context. His purpose in the letter is to strengthen the believers to withstand those pressures. Our aim, therefore, is to explore the letter as an example of the apostle responding contextually to such influences. And I think that we know that one or another, if not all three of these kinds of pressures, face so many of our churches today. So, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to have a look, we're going to outline a Christ-centred response to influences challenging Christ's uniqueness and sufficiency, because those were the two issues. Is Christ alone and Christ himself so unique that you've got to have a total loyalty to him, which excludes you from also adding on other religious views? Is he so totally sufficient for all of our human needs that we don't need other add-ons to the Christian faith. This was the challenge, and it's the challenge that continues in so many of our churches today. He approaches, so I want to, he approaches in the whole letter, I want to suggest, the contextualization task by first, in the first half of the letter, laying what I'm calling the contextualization foundations. Three main sections in that first part. He's confirming the importance of ongoing growth for them as Christians. He's declaring Christ's cosmic role and all-sufficient redemption, and he's reaffirming the theological educator's task. You didn't realise how important that was for dealing with false teaching, did you? Because it is. It's fundamental. Just as you need to have a, a true and a clear image of Christ, you've got to have theological educators who understand their role, or so Paul says in this letter, by the way he develops it because he puts right at the centre this big section all about theological educators and what they're supposed to be doing. I find it hard to understand how our assembly folks still think there's nothing about it in the Bible, but that's okay. Um, then he switches tune, or on the basis of that foundation, there's a second half to the letter, and this is the way in which the contextualisation strategy goes a, a phase deeper, and there's three more parts in the last part of the letter. First, he develops a constructive Christ-centered approach in the last part or most of chapter 2 and the first few verses of chapter 3. He then addresses essential uh, <coughs> moral and social transformations that are necessary, things that have got to change in their social and moral lives with principles about them. And then in the last section, he applies particular behavioral patterns to work those things out in the local Colossian context, all with the aim of strengthening them to withstand these pressures that are pushing in on them. We're going to work through those six things quite quickly and um, see if we can get a feel for how important each one of them is in a, an integrated contextualization approach. Yes, quite consciously, you notice what I'm doing. It's not proof text we need, it's what does the whole letter say? because the message is in the whole letter, not in little bits of it. So we've got to get the whole letter together. Okay, first, to handle pressures of the kind we've just been talking about, challenges to our faith, the first thing to do is that we have to confirm the importance of ongoing growth within the church. Understanding clearly and appreciating what we've already achieved and what we already possess in Christ is fundamental. It becomes the first step in building a protective shield for addressing the kinds of opposition we've described. Thus, Paul reminds the Colossians and gives thanks to God for their previous experience. He then confirms the importance of continuing to grow in the Christian walk. So, let's look quickly at just the headings of what he's doing. 
He says first, or he starts first by reiterating, thankfully, the pattern of their previous growth into Christ. He gives praise to God for the way they had been responding to the message in faith, love, and hope. They had responded and they were continuing in an active trust in Christ. There was a living relationship with Christ, which was now the focal point of what they were doing. And he wants them to constantly remember that it's faith in Christ, which is the center of all spiritual life. Their life orientation depended on Christ as the source of their life, meaning, and purpose. They believed Christ and his teachings as their ongoing truth. They were trusting Christ and his desires for them as the scale for their values. They were committed to Christ as the focal point for their lives. His plans were now their plans. He participated in their homes and work. They depended actively upon him as their guide, provider, and friend. And as we were hearing in our devotion this morning, he's reminding them of what they've already achieved in their life in Christ by faith. Faith then becomes the central theme of the whole letter. It comes up continually through. On the notes, you'll get some details of that. That also, though, responded in love. Not only the faith relationship with the living God through Christ vertically, as it were, but there's also a changed relationship horizontally. They'd heard the gospel and it affected what they did socially. They were showing love, an outgoing dimension. Their response showed the love they had for all the saints. Meeting Christ had transformed the way they related to others. The unselfish, practical thoughtness, thoughtfulness and kindness of Christ was now being shown for all God's family. Not just to those they related to easily, but to those of different ethnic and cultural groups in Colossae. And almost certainly there were Phrygians, Greeks, Jews and Romans at least. They had begun to welcome, accept and to live for those of different social, educational, economic, religious and, and religious backgrounds. We know specifically of Philemon and Onesimus, who are members of this church, the slave master and the slave who worship together. Paul had to write a special letter to make sure that it continued, of course. But as the, one of the earlier Tyndale commentaries says, the communion of saints means not a series of loosely related cliques, but an all-embracing and self-abnegating fellowship, self-denying embracing of one another across those social boundaries and they'd learnt it and they were living that way. And we could go through the way in which love again becomes a major theme of the letter. In chapter 1 verse 8, love comes from the Spirit. In chapter 2 verse 2, love knits believers together and is the prerequisite for understanding Christ in depth. Chapter 3 verse 14, love unites them in a real harmony. Chapter 3 verse 19, love is the oil and driving strength of home life. Right relationships to each other. Love in their internal social relationships in the fellowship. This was another strength that needed to be encouraged and supported if they were to withstand these pressures from outside. The quality of internal life determines the way in which we will resist the outward pressures. And he gives thanks for the way in which they had <coughs> grown in, or had their response had grown through and from hope the forward-moving dimension of their response. Hope's all about purpose and goals, and the Colossians had a hope stored up for them in heaven, which had transformed their attitude to time, transformed their attitude to death, and transformed their present values. They had a focus on Christ, which orientated toward them toward the future and to his return, which we'll think in another message later, um, gives a radical attitude to the way in which they approach daily living. That theme of hope also becomes a continuing theme through the letter. But Paul also gives thanks in a very particular way, not just for the triad of faith, hope and love, but in verses 5 and 6 he spends quite some time explaining how they had already grasped the gospel and they'd grasped the truth of God's message very deeply. He, <coughs> the depth of appreciation of the nature of the good news was vital for withstanding the alternative religious pressures. Paul noted three ways in which they'd understood the gospel. They'd understood it as universal yet personal truth amidst the confusion all around them. He stresses this side of things. He says the gospel that you've received as truth is being received all around the world. You're not the centre of the world, but just as you're having this experience of God's life through Christ, 
The same thing's happening in other cultures all around the world. And we need to remind ourselves of that if we are the ones who are under pressure, that we're part of a very large global family. But not just a, a very general thing. It had come to them very specifically as a group in Colossae with all of their particular problems. It was theirs and yet it's the world's. And this global yet personal aspect of the gospel is part of the distinctiveness of the Christian message. It belongs to all. God so loved the world, but Christ loved me and gave himself for me. And it's this global but personal part of the gospel that he says, hold on to that, it's very, very important. They'd receive the gospel too as a globally productive seed. He says, as among you now, it's growing amongst you, it's become a seed and it's sprouting and flourishing. The same thing's happening right around the world. The gospel is a productive seed that needs good soil and in fact a variety of soils to show out the, the variety of its fullness and its potential as we mentioned yesterday. But this gospel is all centred in grace, he says, and that understood it. That grasped the difference between a legally based religion full of ritual and laws and do's and don'ts and one based on a living relationship generously, freely offered through God to us or through Christ to us. One of the biggest problems we had in PNG in the early days, and it still continues today with each new generation, is to help people realize that the initial conversion, which often was a conversion from trust in the spirit powers or fear of the spirit powers and fear of the law, the tambus, the rules and regulations of the spirit powers, they made a real conversion to fear God and Jesus Christ and his tambus and his laws and his legalistic system. But that wasn't the essence of it. It had to go a step deeper. It had to realize that the Christian system wasn't just another form of the same religious pattern, but it was a radically different one. It was based on grace. And that's what Paul's saying in verses 5 and 6 of chapter 1. Yes, they'd grasped what the good news was all about. And of course, they all had, also had the advantage of a really good model missionary. And they, Paul acknowledges the fact that they had had a good messenger bringing the gospel to them, and he reminds them of Epaphras' qualities, quite unusual qualities there. He says he stood out because he demonstrated what a real leader is like. First, he was a good teacher. We know that because he says, you learned from him. And of course, Epaphras was one of Paul's grads, and we're always proud of our graduates, aren't we? What am I saying? We all know as theological educators, surely, that the Bible has a very, very clear picture of a two-year Bible school program that the Apostle Paul ran. And the Bible does have patterns of Bible schools as the chief means of discipling people for the sake of evangelism across a whole region. And Epaphras is the obvious product of that. You know what I'm talking about? Acts chapter 19, verses 9 and 10. Surely you've all memorized it as theological educators. Here's our charter. In the school of Tyrannus, every day for two years, a two-year curriculum with a daily program. And if you receive, if you take notice of the received Western text, they say from the 11th, from the 5th to the 11th hours, which if you understand how they calculated time, means from 11 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon when all the rest of the people in Ephesus were doing what? On siesta. Questions of commitment. They don't need siestas, they need the Bible. So during siesta for two years every day, they came together and Paul taught them. How do you like that? What sort of curriculum is that? Paul, two years every day for four hours a day. Five hours a day, actually. That's a Bible school. That's a theological college if it's Paul doing the teaching. And the scripture says in chapter 19, verse 10, it says, therefore, because of the Bible school program, the whole of the province, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. They all scattered. They all took the message and evangelized. And Epaphras is obviously one of those graduates of Paul's Bible school in the school of Tyrannus in Ephesus. So here we've got a brilliant example of, of a graduate. Notice he is not only a good teacher, notice what else it says about him. Sorry, I get a bit excited about this because I get tired of people saying the Bible has no example of Bible schools. Well, they should read it, the Bible, and think about what it says. Okay, he also, of course, not only was a good teacher, he was a cooperative hard worker. Sadly, those are unusual 
two things put together. There's lots of hard workers who are seldom cooperative, and lots of cooperative people who don't like working hard. But Epaphras had got it together. He had both of them. He was one who was appreciated because he was loved by those he served. He was a dependable, trusty toiler, a faithful deacon, and he's one who spoke well of the people he served. I wonder if that characterises you and me. Now, when, when you're together with your colleagues, what do you talk about? Do you talk about the good things you're seeing in the students, about the great things they're doing, or is it always the problems and the pain in the neck that they're causing you and all the other things that you talk about? Well, it says that Epaphras had reported their love in the Spirit. He would talked about the way in which they were growing in love because of the Spirit's work in them. That's a good teacher. That's a good graduate. It's a good graduate profile there if you want to think about that sometime. But sorry, I stress that we're theological educators. <clears throat> Paul not only reiterated, thankfully, though, what had been going on, he's saying, in the pressure upon you, in the midst of all of these false teachings around you, there's one other thing required. You've got to keep growing. Complacency leaves you vulnerable to false teachings. Thinking you've arrived in your Christian experience and you've got it all there is the most dangerous position to be in. And so in these glorious next few verses from 9 to 14, Paul challenges them to go on to further growth. Notice the way he says it. He challenges them to go on in their knowing of God's will. He wants them to have it in spiritual wisdom and understanding. He wants them to know or to live lives that are fit for Christ. That means to live lives that are pleasing to him, that are growing in fruitful good works, not powerful miracles, but fruitful good works, he says, is the mark of a, a life that's fit for Christ. And it's a life which increases in the knowledge of God. It will keep you growing closer and closer to him. It's all there in the verse. He wants them to grow in their experience of God's power because God's power is there to help us endure and be patient. And if you're in theological education, that's exactly what you need because working with people, you need the spirit of God's mighty power. And Paul uses yeah, the strength of God, the power of God, the dynamic of God. He brings all the words for power and he says you need all of that just to be patient and to keep going um, with people. And he says, I want you to be those people who are thanking God for all the amazing things you already have. And he lists them there very quickly in verses 12 to 14. They've been qualified to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. They've been given a great future inheritance. They've been delivered from the dominion of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of light. How? Because of the forgiveness and redemption that they've entered into in Christ. And he says, thank God continually for these things. Grow in your understanding of them. Keep going. Yes, we can thank God for where you've come from, but are you still moving forward? That's why the false teachings are taking such a toll, because you thought you'd got there and you'd arrived. In Papua New Guinea, a lot of people you say, how are you going? Are you a Christian? And you know, they'll come back and say, em now, me was was finis. And you can work out what that means. Yes, I'm okay. I've been washed. I've been baptized. And that's all that matters. But it isn't all that matters. The question is, are you continuing to grow now? Because that's your only defense against the pressures of false teaching is to be continually moving forward. So let's do what uh, we'll see Paul does. Let's try and see if you've actually been with me for the last few minutes and see what it says up to here. Um, if we had a pianist, but I don't think we do have. Good. That would be much appreciated. It's number two in that um, list of the ones. Yes. They're all set to um, well-known tunes, so you'll pick it up quite quickly. But let's just revise what we've just said, because as we'll see in a moment, Paul uses hymns as his teaching method. We're going to do the same this morning. If you understand, you can.
them to give thanks and continue, give thanks for how they have grown and continue to keep on growing because that's the starting point in handling properly um, or laying properly a foundation to oppose the false teaching. He goes straight on to declare positively the foundational impor importance and the extent of Christ's cosmic role and all sufficient redemption. If Understanding where we've come from and how we've grasped and understood the gospel is fundamental. Well, even more important is knowing who Christ is and understanding how he relates to the issues and the questions being raised by the false teachers. And so we have this absolutely glorious um, presentation of Christ in those verses we read at the beginning of our session. Let's just first note the components and the choice of discourse terminology, if we want to use the jargon in the style of language of this section. Paul, the master teacher, now picks up on key aspects of the threatening teachings and he weaves a positive, wholly constructive picture of Christ and the way he transcends and uniquely fulfills anything the alternative teachings had to offer. He also presents this section in, either, in a hymn, either using and adapting an existing hymn or more likely composing one of his own to encapsulate the instruction. Paul knew engaging the whole personality was essential for in-depth learning, so the combined mental and emotive form of a hymn best suited the rich theology of the passage and no doubt assured good memorization and use in ongoing worship. How much of our students' whole life gets involved in their learning? Just their mind or their feelings, their emotions, their actual creative expression and their dramatic and their musical abilities as well. When did you last uh, write a song to summarise your key lecture that you love so much? But don't we all follow Paul? He does it regularly in his letters, so we should be doing the same. Okay. Um, oh, he gives thanks to God, or he calls them, he declares and he speaks out positively, he proclaims the way in which they had already been experiencing Christ's cosmic supremacy and sufficiency. We need to grasp these things he's saying. We need to know for ourselves in the present situation just who Christ is. And so behind each of the rival teachings seeking the Colossians' allegiance lay the fundamental human quest to know and experience at the deepest, the worldview level, answers to concerns about human meaning, about purpose, and about a resolution of our mani or some answer to our manifest failures in achieving a depth of satisfaction in living. Paul believed fervently that this quest had been fully answered in Christ. Therefore, to ensure Christians were not drawn away to their lesser perceptions, he presented Christ in his many-sided many superiority over all other claimants in the crucial cosmological, epistemological and soteriological aspects of the human search. And he looks at each of those things. First, he says, Christ is the one who reveals the Father. Humans have a longing to know what God's like, to know what the beyond is like, to know what the spiritual world is really all about, to actually have a clear perception of it. And Paul says at the beginning here, the Son is the image of the invisible God. It's in the Son that we see the fullest possible expression of the true living God. He is the answer to our quest. Remember his words as Jesus broke into our human scene. He says, 
No one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Matthew 11. I and my Father are one. John 10.30. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. God has revealed himself in Christ so as people can have the true knowledge of the ultimate realities. And because we share something, although such a pale reflection of it, of that same image, we are actually capable to understand what we see. We need his help, of course, in it. But he stands before us and he says, I am the truth. No one comes to the Father but by me. So we have the answer to that quest to know God, to know all about the unseen world. It's all there in human form, perfectly, completely. We need to turn our eyes to Christ, says Paul. But he then presents Christ as the one who controls the whole universe. And of course, this is answering a second basic human yearning. How does God relate to the material universe? The cosmological question also finds its answer in Christ. He is, in fact, Lord over the whole seen and unseen universe. Paul spelled it out in a number of key relationships. First, he says, Christ is the firstborn, not the first in time, but the one who, like the firstborn son in a family, has the privileges, the rights, the responsibilities of the elder brother. Now, had I listened to my Maori folk in New Zealand before I went, our indigenous people, before I went to Papua New Guinea, they would have taught me all about what a tuakana does, and the older brother has special responsibilities. But it was in Papua New Guinea that I began to understand the significance of being the elder brother, of being the firstborn. Because in Papua New Guinean society, the firstborn is fully responsible for all the major life choices of every one of the siblings. He's fully responsible for dispensing the whole of the father's inheritance fully responsible for ensuring the continuity of the father's name, concerns, business, the family honour, is all to be looked after by the, the firstborn. And that's what it's saying here. It's offering a conception of the universe which sees the universe as a family, as meaningful with having personality, if you like, and Christ is controlling, dispensing, caring for, looking after it, understanding it, sure, making sure it all functions properly, integrating the work of every part of that created universe. Now I find that a much, much better image to understand the world we live in, the globe, the cosmos, the whole universe that we live in, much better than understanding it as a set or the result of a set of cold, unchangeable laws that just happen to have worked this way. A personal household conception of the creation is a wonderful biblical understanding of the world around us. And Christ is right there at the centre as the firstborn. And our African friends could probably tell you what it really means because I'm only trying to repeat what I've learned from others. But he's also the source and the agent of all creation, including the powers. He holds the position of prior priority over every part. He's the one who is the goal and the sustainer of the whole created reality. He's the one who is Lord in every possible sense of the whole created universe. These sweeping claims set Christ far above the options on offer through the deceptive teachings at Colossae. Christ's superiority over all rival claimants is seen in the way he reveals the Father and the way in which he's the Lord of the physical universe, Paul would say to us today. But he's also the one who's directing the church. And in the hymn, there's a beautiful balance between what we've just seen about revealing the Father and working in creation and what he now says about Christ's role in the church. He is its head. He's the one who holds together this new family. And again, he's called the firstborn, the first from the dead in the church. He has the same responsibilities. He's the one who makes the decision. He's the one who holds the life and the well-being of the church in his hand, as it were. So, little wonder that in verse 19, we read that he embodies the fullness of God. This Lord of the cosmos and head of the church is in fact God of very God, God of the true reality of God. In him, God's full deity gladly dwells. All true fullness is brought down to us in this person, live in him. There's no further need for vain human quests trying to find a way to the heaven of heavens. 
mortal, mere human rivals, even emperors who claim to be God, pale into insignificance beside this revelation of God. The glory, the greatness of understanding God has been made accessible to all, not just to some spiritual elite who have the secret, but to all who will look on the face of Christ Jesus. Chapter 2, he goes on to say, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Our God contracted to a span, incomprehensibly made man. He is the image, he is the Lord, he is the head, he is God. But there's more. He's also the one who reconciles the world to himself and us, says Paul. And you know these things very well, but he talks about the um I can make that in a moment. He talks about the what he's done, the for whom he did it, how and the why, and he spells it all out there in those wonderful verses twenty to twenty two. Through him he reconciled to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour, but now he's reconciled you by Christ's physical death through death to present you holy in his sight, through his physical body through death, to present you holy in his sight. This beautiful gathering it of all up in the reconciling work of Christ. So, Paul wraps up this section by saying, all right, if you've met, known and seen who Christ is, well then, clearly, there's one further requirement. That is that you stand firm and you keep going. He says, you can know Christ in this way, provided you don't move, that, provided that you are continuing in your faith, established and firm, and you don't move from the hope held out to you in the gospel. If you've known and understood what we've just been talking about, then the obvious implication is you can't defect to others. You must hang in there and hold on and keep going. How clearly have we got that? We sang about it earlier, so we won't sing it again, but we could just read it perhaps antiphonally. This side can read the first half of each line and this side can read the second half. All right? Yeah. In Christ our God is seen. He owns and rules the world. He is our source, he is our goal. Christ is the Lord of all. Of ours, both great and small. He is the first, he is the last. Christ is the church's head. In all things he must lead. He must direct. He must hold sway. This Christ is truly God. And by his cross and blood, he reconciles, he brings us near. So let us then hold fast, still trusting to the last, no other God, no other name, in all the world, our Lord, our Lord. All right, how are we doing? Paul's saying, know Christ and you'll withstand the opposition. Then he goes on strangely after that amazing, glorious, taking us up into the heavenlies, as it were, showing us the greatness of Christ. And he said, that's what you have in our gospel. And then he says, yeah, and it's that gospel that I work for every day. I'm its servant. And he goes into probably the most biographical section of the whole of the New Testament. And he just pours out of his heart about who he is and what his role is. Because he knows that unless they grasp the fact that teaching, theological education, and respect for theological educators is fundamental in the Christian understanding of the gospel, well then they're still going to be um, open to abuse from others. And of course Paul isn't just doing this because this is what he thinks and this is he thinks he's pretty great himself. No, no, he's doing exactly what Christ did. 
Remember in Matthew 23, in that awful attack that Jesus makes on the hypocritical theological educators of his day, he talks about the hypocritical scribes and, and teachers of the law. What's his last point in that whole tirade? Where does he finish that up? Where does he bring it to? The last part of all that, I'm sure you all know it off by heart, don't you? He says, you know, you're worse than a brood of snakes, he says, that's where he gets to. He says, therefore, because that's true, what's he going to do? He tells one thing he's going to do in response to all of that, and what's the one thing? He says, I'm going to send you new prophets, teachers, and wise men. But they're going to be trained in the kingdom of God, and they're going to be different. The answer to false teachers, hypocritical teachers, is good, right ones who do it properly. And Christ sets that pattern clearly. Read Matthew 23. It's a very powerful conclusion to what's been an awful, awful sermon. He promises a new kind of teacher because they're the answer to the false kind of teachers. And Paul's doing the same here. Now, because I actually said all of this six years ago in the same place, I'm not going to say it again, but just quickly remind you of it all. You asked me to do it as an opening message last time, well, the time before last, the first of the meetings here. He goes through the list quickly and he says, the task of the theological educator is we've been given a word-centered commission to fulfill through the church by managing responsibly the word of God. And the notes that you'll get later um, spell that out considerably. He says, the message, it's the message of riches to make known to the nations. Christ among you, Colossians, the hope of glory. This is the wonderful message we have to teach and to, and to present. And of course, mission, the taking of the gospel to every nature, other, other nations, is and always must be the integrating part of every theological cur curriculum. That's true, isn't it? Good. I'm glad some people, I saw two people nod. That's great. Um, if it isn't, it should be. Um, the purpose is to mature believers in Christ and to present them faultless in the presence of God. The method and the cost, though, is proclaiming Christ, coaching people with all the Paul says, all the perspiration I can pour into it and all the inspiration God can pour into me. He says, it's going to take all of my commitment and all of the Spirit's infilling at the end of the chapter there. He talks about the learning environment that's necessary for the goal to be achieved. The early couple of verses of chapter 2 are amazing. They say, we need to be encouraged, we need a situation of encouragement and of unity so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. Now we all know the goal is for them to know all the fullness that's in Christ, but sometimes we neglect the environmental conditions that are necessary for that to happen. He says that without having encouraged hearts and unity in love, you can't know the fullness that's in Christ. So the question we should ask of our theological colleges is not how much do you explain the greatness of Christ, but uh, do your students have encouraged hearts when they sit in your lectures or do they get bombarded and feel bad all the time? How much encouragement of heart comes from our lectures and how much unity in, the, in, in love is the, the atmosphere of our theological schools? Because Paul says that's essential for us to know the fullness of Christ. You can't know the fullness of Christ in a context of bickering, mistrust, and um, dog eats dog. But we know, we're theological educators, this is our goal, we, our daily work, we know all about it. Um, and he finishes up by stressing again their importance, the importance of theological education. He says in verse 4 or 5 there, <clears throat> I tell, you that, I tell you this, so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I'm absent from you in body, I'm ever-present with you in spirit, and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. The end of the previous section, be firm, stand firm. At the end of this section, we teach, we do our job fully and properly so that people will be firm and stand mature and stable in their Christian experience. And this is what Paul's trying to do. He's laying this strong foundation, saying that the quality of 
life in Christ, the progressive development of the church, the understanding of the gospel and of Christ, and theological educators are doing their job. This is fundamental to deal with um, false teachers. And he's halfway through the letter. He hasn't even started to talk about them all because he knows right foundations are absolutely essential in dealing with the problems. All right, I'd like to sing again, quick. No, maybe this one, maybe, maybe we'll, just, we'll just read through this as a prayer. We'll come back in a moment to the next one. All right. Let's just read this through personally and make it a prayer as theological educators. Christ calls us now. Just read it for yourself. All right, Paul now starts to dig into the, if you like, the technical aspects of the contextualization task. Um, I suggest that he now is beginning a spiral of uh, contextualization which has to go on continually um, for people to continue to uh, withstand the opposition that they're facing. He now starts in chapter 2, verse 4, to the chapter 3, verse 4, and develops a constructive, Christ-centered, and cruciform approach to this cancerous teaching which is pushing in and the practices that are pushing in around them. Um, he starts in chapter 2, this is 4 to 8, by saying he, he wants them to identify clearly the crucial questions, the crucial choices before them. He says in verses um, 4 to 8, don't be fooled, um, continue in the way you started as you began your life in Christ, so live in him, as we were reminded in our devotion again this morning. Keep going the same way as you began and watch out because there are folk whose clever philosophies will try to ensnare and entrap you. But Paul has a very careful analysis of those false teachings and he says the problem is with them is that they're based on human traditions or elemental spirit powers. And whichever way they may be, they're earthbound and they're restricted if they're only based on human traditions. And if they're based on the stoichia to Cosmo, if they're based on the elemental spirits of the universe, well then they are still based on created beings, not the creator himself. And the big problem with any such philosophy is that they're not based on Christ, as he says in verse 8. Without Christ being the foundation, without actually taking and applying all the things we've said about Christ's position as the revealer of God, Christ's position as ruler of the universe, Christ's position, position as the only sole saviour, well then, no other philosophy can possibly be adequate. If they haven't got Christ in his proper place in their philosophy, well then, they're flawed, and we need to recognise that clearly. So he says, test and assess these alternative options which are being held before you, and make sure you analyse them properly so that you can make the right choices about them. He then goes on in the part of the letter which deals most explicitly with the um, or prepares to do here, or that he reiterates both the subjective and the objective ways in which people have, or the experiences they've had as they've been united with Christ. It talks about the way in which um, a whole lot of things are true because they are in Christ. Um, if we had time to look at it in detail, which we don't, um, we would see that um, he says, First of all, that all the fullness of God dwells bodily in Christ, as we mentioned before. Then he says that in him, you believers are complete and the cosmos is reordered. In him, believers have experienced the reality of that circumcision pointed toward. They've had a spiritual circumcision. The old, has been, the old life's been taken away. They've been given a new life. In him and with him, believers have been made alive together with God. And he reminds them of the experience they've had of being united with the living God in Christ. 
And then he reminds them of the objective part of that. He says, he has forgiven our sins. He has wiped out our condemnation that was against us. He has disarmed the powers that were dominating us. And he did it all in the cross. So he again comes back and reminds them of the way they've had an experience and they need to remember that experience and realize where it came from, the subjective and objective dimensions of it. We as brethren are very strong on the objective part. We don't often keep reminding people enough about what they have personally experienced subjectively as well. And then he goes on to call on them to choose fullness of life in Christ, not to hold on to these cancerous alternatives which are there. And he gives a series of warnings first. He says, don't play with false alternatives. And he says that you can be condemned by shadow-like rituals when you could keep on enjoying the reality in Christ. And he says, what do you want? A shadow-like experience of religion based on rituals or real life linked with Christ in a personal way? He says, don't be disqualified by spiritual speculation, all these people having wonderful experiences they talk about. Just keep growing secure in a real relationship with Christ as your head. And then he says, don't be dominated by religious rules because with Christ you've died to all that old style, that old pattern of life, and you've come alive in a living relationship with the living God. So don't let the old elemental spirits continue to dominate because they've been put to death when you rejoined with Christ in baptism. Rather, in the, chapter, the beginning of chapter 3, he says, <clears throat> In Christ, enjoy the reality of being united with the risen, reigning Lord who's returning. And he goes through the, the facts of the possibility of a relationship with Christ. And he says, this is the option. Do you want ritual? Do you want speculation? Do you want legalistic regulations on every part of your life? Or do you want a personal living friendship with one who will be your guide and head and director and who brings you into an experience of the future life already because of your union with the resurrected Christ? That choice is what they have to um, face up to. So let's just see if we can think about it in song. And we will have... I don't know if it's all right. Um. As you receive Christ Jesus in him. go on but we can come back that to later as he comes to the last two sections of the letter Paul now addresses the essential areas of social and moral transformation they need to go through to express this new fullness of life in Christ in their lifestyles and in what happens in other words the answer to the false teachers is the renewal and the encouragement of their life in Christ it's the living out of a transformed life expressing Christ's life through their lives, which is the, the next part, if you like, of the um, contextualization challenge. He's not focusing on the wrongs, he's focusing on the positive response, because what he's wanting is a strong church. He, he starts then by looking at the, the moral things they need to deal with and listed there. 
He says, deal decisively with the old self-life. Put to death the earthly thought patterns, the dirty thinking which dominates so much of what's happening in your lives. Get rid of the old ways. Put on the Christ life. Be renewed continually in your thinking, in your attitudes to others. Um, keep that faith dependence working as a reality. Um, find yourself and find others in Christ. There's that beautiful um, part there that there's... In, in verse 10, 11. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is in all and is all. That let go of the old tribal and socio-political boundaries, the splitting up into different factions and groups, that to embrace the real, new, global, multi-ethnic and Christ-centred alternative of the church, and interesting, this is a big comparison. The emperor, the Caesar of the day, claimed to bring all the nations together and to unite people under his great empire. Paul saying, no, 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 I've got a greater imperial experience for you. In Christ, all of those real divisions are broken through fully and properly. And in Christ, the answer to the emperor's claims are lived at a whole new, deeper level when you grapple with the social implications of the gospel. If you give Christ his ultimate lordship in everything, any, everything, and especially in your social relationships, you're going to be a living demonstration that the world of the Caesar has never yet seen. And of course, they are to clothe themselves in Christ. There's a beautiful picture here. He says there are five basic garments you're to put on, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. They are the things that are actually basically what others should see when they look at you, that you're out of clothing. You need a pair of work gloves because you're handling so sensitive issues. You can get contaminated and get spoiled very quickly when you're relating to other people. So you need a pair of gloves. And what are they? They're called forbearance on one hand and forgiveness on the other. Forbearance and forgiveness in the way you handle people. All right? But then you need love as the overalls because only Christ-like love can integrate every aspect of daily life. So you've got this beautiful new wardrobe for the, the new life that he wants us to be living. Then he says these there's these very beautiful lifestyle distinctives of making the peace of God our umpire socially. Don't do anything in relationships with others unless the peace of God rules in your heart. It's a pretty good test. He says, make sure that Christ's word is your resident treasure, that it's Christ's word filling, overflowing in your heart. Let it dwell richly in you so you've got more than enough for yourself and something to share with others. In our modern world, especially in the West, we teach people to try to survive on emergency rations which others have pre-packed and thrown at you and you can grab and run and run and eat them on the way. Paul said, no, 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 let the word dwell in you richly. But that doesn't happen through pre-prepared other people's thoughts. It happens when you do your own exegesis, as we were reminded yesterday, when you dig into the scriptures yourself. And then make the name of Christ the standard that you're trying to live up to. Is what I'm doing fit for someone who names Christ's name? And above everything, let thankfulness characterize your lifestyle. So he sets out this amazing series of illustrations, of pictures of what the new life actually looks like. Now, if I was really modern, well then I'd try to wrap this, and I can't do it really well, so... Here's what it says. Life in Christ brings new demands to abide in his commands. Put to death those selfish ways which destroy a life of praise. Sins of flesh, desire and word, put them off since Christ is Lord. Putting on, putting on his nature new, showing Christ in all we do, leaving pride of school and clan, seeing Christ in every man. We are known as his elect, so his image now reflect. In the things we think and do, putting on Christ's likeness too, sympathetic, kind and meek, offering the other cheek. When there's cause to rant and rave, just forgive as Christ forgave. Let his, his love and peace control heart and mind and all our soul. Let the word of Christ indwell, teach and warn with songs as well, giving thanks by word and deed. Living Christ, this is our creed. Most of all, within our home, may the love of Christ be shown. Man and wife in Christ unite, sharing full and deep delight that our homes and huts may be ruled by Christ continually. Sorry, I didn't do the break dance that goes with it. Um, 
Okay, the other words, if you, I'll be on your things later. And he comes to his final section. He says, he, he's given the general principles there on social and moral things. He now comes and he gives a series of particular behavioral patterns to express the fullness of life in Christ. You see, the final contextualization step is to apply the distinctly Christian patterns of behavior for a missional lifestyle, answering the challenges in the focal points of their daily lives in Colossae. If you want to overcome false teaching, get involved missionally. If you're witnessing, if you're sharing your life in Christ, that's the best protection of all against false teachers. Sit in your huddle, hide yourself away, and you're bound to be vulnerable. Get involved in mission, and there's an inherent strength arises from within it. And so he goes down the list. Christ living in them at home, in those very wise words about spouses mutually being responsible to each other. One, one responsibility for the wife to gladly yield, to open her life to a, to, a, to a husband. That's what subject in the Bible actually means. It's the same thing that Christ shows to his father, that the elder sh or younger show to elder and all this. It's a fundamental Christian social characteristic. Not holding ourselves behind a shield, but opening ourselves to be vulnerable, vulnerable before the other is a fundamental Christian social grace without which we can't relate to anybody. You can't have integrity with anybody unless you're prepared to yield and open yourself to them. And that's what he tells the wife to do to his her husband. But of course, the husband's got a double duty. He's to be loving like Christ and, and this is the hardest of all, not harsh with your wife. I didn't know what that meant until I got married. Um, but it's the hardest thing in the world that I find is a man to obey. It's just so easy to tell her what she should be doing and uh, um, try to insist on it. But that's what the Christ, Christian husband doesn't do. He's got a double responsibility. Living in Christ in their work, and you know the responsibilities. Living in Christ when at prayer and in public. And then the great glorious final section with his um, farewell greetings and his beautiful little pen picture of his, um, his graduate again. He doesn't get tired of uh, talking about Epaphras. Verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greeting. He's always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he's working hard for you and for all those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. And you get the feel, you know what it's like when you finally see a good graduate. And Paul's really great, wants to be able to rejoice in it. And then the final greetings. So, where have we come from? Paul, guided by the Spirit, saw these six integrated steps that we've talked through and listing up there now. He saw these six as a whole, as his response to the threatening teachings eating away at the Colossian church. His careful, positive laying of strong foundations and constructive and progressive development of a case for renewed commitment to Christ, rather than directly attacking the opposition or surrendering to more defection, offer a pattern for approaching the many subtle ways in which the uniqueness and sufficiency of Christ Jesus come under attack today. If Christ is sufficient, if Christ is unique, then let's show it in our lifestyle, says Paul. Here is a biblical theological Christ-centered strategy for strengthening the Christian lifestyles and theological awareness of believers as a protective shield in a multi-religious, pluralistic society. The relevance for us today of this contextualization process is, I think, quite clear. Ours is the task of freshly applying it to cultivate strong church life and for equipping believers for responding to challenges from other faiths in our multi-religious, pluralistic societies today. And would you like to stand up and finish it off? All right, just one last song on the last of those <coughs> sections. <coughs> 